Hopefully you remember the circumplex model of affect from the start of the semester, the model that described the structure of our emotions and moods. Well, there's some interesting research exploring how our emotions tie into organizational change. They broke emotional responses to change down into four categories. First, change proactivity. Picture those colleagues who practically jump out of their seats when a change is announced. Their excitement translates into not just accepting the change, but also actively promoting it. These are the change champions we spoke about earlier, who respond to change with pleasant, activated emotions. The second category is change acceptance. Here we have those who, rather than bouncing off the walls with excitement, give a calm nod of approval. They're not overly energetic, but they're on board. They've got that chill vibe and go with the flow. This response is associated with those pleasant deactivated emotions. But as always, there's the other side of the coin. There's the change resistance response. These folks are huffing in meetings. They're stressing out, maybe even getting a bit angry about the proposed changes. They're not just passive about the change, they actively push back. This response brings up unpleasant activated emotions. Finally, change disengagement. Imagine someone just looking downcast, maybe a little sad or feeling helpless. They're not storming out of meetings or throwing tantrums, but there's a quiet kind of withdrawal there, a subtle resistance. This is when change brings up unpleasant deactivated emotions. So the same organizational change can evoke such a spectrum of emotions, from enthusiastic support to silent withdrawal. And part of effective change management is about managing these emotions. Here's another interesting study. Remember that lecture we had on work stress, where we discussed the idea that threats can be appraised as either challenges or hindrances? Well, this study applied these concepts to understand responses to organizational change. Picture a company going through a merger, and there's this looming cloud of possible redundancies. The researchers wanted to know, how do employees feel about the change management? And also, do they see this massive shift as a big scary threat or an exciting challenge. The findings were intriguing. Employees who saw the change as threatening were kind of like, nope, I'm avoiding this. They didn't support the change, they didn't champion it, and just passively accepted the change was happening. On the other hand, folks who viewed the merger as an opportunity or a challenge, they were hands-on and problem-focused, actively tackling the challenges and championing the change and generally sailing smoother through the stormy seas of the merger. In this study, good change management also made a difference. The better the company supported their employees through the change, the more employees saw the situation as a challenge rather than a threat. The study also dove into this idea of dispositional resistance to change. Think of this like having a friend who refuses to switch from their old flip phone to a smartphone, just because. Some people just naturally resist change. The study found that these folks were more likely to view change management efforts as lacking. This study has important implications for organizations. They've got to think about strategies to address and understand these individuals who might be a bit more set in their ways. Another study looked at how negative responses to organizational change play out over the longer term. They studied an organization going through a restructure, but one where employees were assured there would be no redundancies and they followed this organization for two years. The researchers initially checked in with employees when the restructure started, measuring their perceptions of how the organizational change was being managed. They found that some employees saw the change as a challenge, but even in those early days, many appraised the situation as a threat, thinking this isn't gonna be good for the organization. And some even took it a step further, taking on a harm appraisal, basically thinking this change is going to negatively affect me personally. The researchers then followed up with these employees six months later. Those employees who could put on their rose-tinted glasses and see the change positively and as a challenge, they felt the company still had their back. But for those who felt threatened, they believed the company was breaking their unwritten agreement with the employee, the psychological contract. The fallout of this was feelings of betrayal, distrust, and frustration. Some of these folks even toyed with the idea of jumping ship and leaving the organization. Fast forward to two years after that initial assessment and those initial appraisals at time one had serious weight. If employees felt threatened by the change back then, there was a direct connection to them actually leaving the organization. So this study has huge ramifications for organizations. 
that initial vibe, trust, and communication when rolling out changes can quite literally make or break an employee's commitment to stay. Recall our discussions from the lecture on organizational design about the two predominant models that organizations often lean towards, the mechanistic structure and the organic structure. The mechanistic structure is highly structured. Think of it as a well-oiled machine with each part having a very specific function. There's a defined hierarchy, strict communication pathways, and roles are clearly delineated. In contrast, organic structures are more flexible and adaptive. You can think of the organic structure as a network where everyone collaborates, shares information freely, and decisions are decentralized. Now, when we introduce the concept of change, these two structures respond differently. Mechanistic structures, by their very nature, tend to resist change due to their built-in rigidity. It's a bit like trying to turn a large ship around quickly. There's inherent resistance due to its structure and size. The organic structures, however, with their adaptability, are inherently more receptive to change. They can pivot, adapt, and implement new strategies with relative ease. And research suggests that organic structures often outperform their mechanistic counterparts in areas of innovation and responsiveness to change. So in addition to how the change is managed, the design of the organization itself can also significantly influence its ability to navigate change. So we know that resistance to change is common and can have quite detrimental effects for the organization. So how might the organization try to overcome these changes? Addressing resistance to organizational change is both a complex and nuanced endeavor. It requires understanding the dynamics at play at multiple levels, from individuals to teams and to the organization at large. One approach is coercion, a directive approach where employees are forced to accept the change. This type of tactic may be needed in urgent situations like the COVID-19 pandemic, but this can often backfire as it tends to generate a high level of resistance. Another tactic is manipulation. This involves marketing the change in a positive light, but can be perceived as insincere. For instance, if a company is introducing a new software platform that may be more cumbersome for employees but saves the company money, they might present it as an advanced tool for greater employee efficiency. If employees quickly realize that the new system does not truly prioritize their efficiency or work quality, but is primarily a cost-saving measure, they may feel deceived. Such perceived discrepancies between messaging and reality can breed distrust and resistance to future changes. This perception of insincerity, once established, can be difficult to overcome. Another possible tactic is negotiation. Offering incentives can be a means to persuade employees. For example, if a software company is transitioning to a new programming language that requires its developers to undergo intensive training, the company might offer bonuses, additional paid time off, or even sponsorship for professional courses to those who adapt quickly and proficiently. While this may motivate many to embrace the change eagerly, problems can arise if employees feel that the reward disproportionately favors certain groups or are not distributed based on merit. If one team gets extensive training and resources while others don't, or if bonuses seem arbitrary, it can lead to feelings of resentment and inequity undermining the original intent of the negotiation. There's also selection. This is a longer term strategy focusing on hiring individuals predisposed to embrace change. While this can be effective, it takes time. It's usually a complement to other short term change strategies. And then there's education and communication. This is a more proactive approach to keep stakeholders informed. Effective communication, particularly from leadership, can frame change in a positive, actionable manner. A key idea here is to foster a perception of change as a challenge rather than a threat. Facilitation and support are also important. Offering counseling, training, or other resources to employees can ease the transition. This promotes buy-in and commitment, reducing resistance. Also important is adopting a participatory approach. This means directly involving employees in the change process, and this is regarded as best practice. This can range from consultation to more integrative methods where employees participate in key decision-making processes. A notable example is mergers, where employees can vote on new branding elements. This sort of engagement can build a sense of ownership of the change process among employees. And of course, good change management might involve a blend of many different tactics, 
though ideally keeping coercion and manipulation to a minimum where possible. There are a range of models practitioners use in the field to guide organizational change. Two influential models that have stood the test of time are Lewin's three-step model and Cotter's eight-step plan. Lewin's three-step model is perhaps the most iconic in the field of organizational change. The first step is unfreeze. Before introducing change, it's essential to dismantle the existing status quo. This involves preparing employees for what's to come, communicating the reasons behind the impending changes, and ensuring that they see the value and are motivated to be a part of it. Let's return to the example of the software firm. Say they're still using outdated project management tools in the area of advanced digital solutions. Before introducing a cutting edge digital tool, the leadership would first need to communicate with teams about the inefficiencies of the current system, demonstrate how the new tools can drastically enhance productivity, and ensure employees understand the strategic vision behind the shift. As part of this, leadership might organize workshops and feedback sessions to address concerns and build enthusiasm. The second step is change. This phase involves the actual implementation of the change. Here, it's vital to offer adequate support to stakeholders during this transition phase. So once the software firm starts transitioning to the new digital tool, they'll likely want to provide training sessions. They might engage experts to teach teams how to use the tool effectively or offer online resources for self-paced learning. And the third step is refreeze. Once the change is in place, the organization should concentrate its effort on cementing this new approach, ensuring that it becomes the new norm. Here, the organization should take measures to prevent reversion to old practices. For example, after a few months of using the new digital tool, the software firm could institutionalize its usage by incorporating it into standard operating procedures, providing more advanced training, and even recognizing or rewarding teams who have effectively integrated the tool into their daily tasks. Periodic reviews can be set up to ensure that the teams aren't reverting to the old system out of habit. Cotter's model, on the other hand, is an eight-step process for leading change. It provides a more detailed approach compared to Lewin's three-step model. The first step of Cotter's model is establish a sense of urgency. Inspire people to move. Make objectives real and relevant. Imagine a company that's lagging behind competitors due to outdated technologies. The first step would involve highlighting this gap showcasing how competitors are advancing and underscoring the opportunities they're missing out on. Make a call to action that's palpable and urgent. The second step is to create a guiding coalition. This isn't a one person job. The company needs to get the right people in place with the right emotional commitment and the right mix of skills and skill levels. The company could assemble a team with members from various departments, say tech, marketing, sales, ensuring a mix of expertise to champion the change. The third step, create a new vision. Get the team to establish goals and a strategy for achieving those goals. Say the company wants to adopt cutting edge AI technology to enhance product recommendations. They might craft a clear vision, like become a leader in personalized shopping by the end of the decade. The fourth step is communicate that vision. Spread the word to as many people as possible. Regular town halls, newsletters, or workshops could be organized, ensuring everyone knows the vision and how it'll steer the company to a leadership position. And then empower others, remove barriers to change, enable constructive feedback, and provide employees with lots of support from leaders. At this point, the company might hone in on departments resisting this tech overhaul and offer them training and resources to address concerns and pave the way for a smoother transition. The next step is to create and reward short-term wins. Set goals that are easy to achieve and recognize when these goals are met. Celebrate the first successful AI recommendation that boosts sales, or the first month where the company outperforms a competitor. This keeps morale high and provides tangible proof of progress. And then consolidate, reassess, and adjust. Don't let up once the change is in place. Encourage ongoing progress reporting. Highlight what's been achieved and identify areas for continuous improvement. So for example, six months in, the company would evaluate. Maybe the AI isn't efficient with certain product categories. So adjustments would be made, always keeping the end vision in sight. Finally, reinforce the changes so that they stick. Reinforce the new normal through recruitment, promotion, new change leaders, and weaving the change into company culture. 
So over time, as the AI system becomes integral, the company might prioritize hiring team members familiar with AI, offer promotions based on innovative uses of the technology, and ensure this change is deeply ingrained in their culture. So while Lewin's model lays the foundation with its unfreeze, change, refreeze approach, Cotter's model delves deeper, offering a more comprehensive step-by-step -step guide. But you can see how Lewin's and Cotter's models overlap. Lewin's freeze phase maps onto the first four phases of Cotter's model. Steps five, six, and seven in Cotter's model are about movement. And that final step, reinforcing the change, is about refreezing.